Friday afternoon, folks, the Ides of July. Uh, July 15th, Ted Rolson here in Honolulu at our Think Tech studio hosting the show Where the Drone Leads, where we try to bring to uh, our, our public uh, information about the emerging uh, domain of droneism. Uh, there's so many different changes happening every week and uh, recent rules released by the FAA and interpretations prior to that and such that we need to continually use this opportunity to bring to you information about what is happening in that world so you can be part of it and uh, you can observe the, the uh, safe and, and uh, correct growth of that particular segment of our future business here in Hawaii. That's a long-winded introduction. I'd like to uh, welcome on our show today Leonard Lagan, who's been on the show before. Leonard uh, is actually in New Mexico right now. Leonard is a, uh, I don't know what we can use to describe you, Leonard. You've been doing UAV and drone work for <laughs> a long time and also manned aircraft work. So you're a manager, an operator, a consultant. Uh, uh, every aspect of dronism is uh, present in Leonard's uh, past experience. It's the, the old man in the mountains, what you're describing. <laughs> well, the old man of the UAV mountains. Well, we're all old men here, unfortunately, on the show. Actually, we had some really young kids on the show. I got white hair. They all had black hair a couple of weeks ago. So there is a interest in the younger generation, Leonard, to come in. And in fact, part of our job, I think, collectively, is to lay a path forward that they can follow into and then make better from what we've uh, uh, been working in the past. Anyway, Leonard, been on, well, I think you were on our show back in uh, maybe a year or so ago we were, when you were up at the University of Alaska, associated with the Alaska uh, State Test Site. And so we're overdue in getting you back on, Leonard, and uh, thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Ted. Okay, you're right now in New Mexico, no longer Alaska. Uh, well, I'm, I'm sitting in New Mexico, but presently I work for NASA. Okay, so you're part of the NASA uh, Armstrong, I believe. Uh, that, no, NASA Ames, NASA Ames. Uh, out of the uh, Silicon Valley okay. Bay Area. And, and that is a really interesting perspective that you would then bring because we've had so many recent uh, issues of rules, interpretation of rules, and, and now uh, very close to getting some rules finalized. And it would be really interesting for me and I think our folks here in the Hawaii test site to understand and, and see how you at the NASA level uh, observe and then deal with these uh, multiple changes in interpretation and rules coming forth. In fact, let's well, I'm going to tread carefully there okay. because I can't speak for NASA. Remember, I'm a contractor that works for NASA, and uh, and they uh, they have their own approach to how they're going to observe these new rules that come out. I can only speak to my own experience uh, when I address this uh, these matters with you. That's great. I think uh, we wouldn't ask you to do any more than that. But I but the point is that uh, these there are a lot of changes, a lot of. Uh, new information coming out and it's very difficult for us in the game to pay attention to it and to be common in terms of our understanding and interpretation. Just think of the public out there. Think of the people in the educational system. Think in the, uh, the law enforcement people who are obligated to keep these uh, operating safely. Uh, the humanitarian people, environmental people who use these systems. Just think how hard it must be for them to keep track of all these uh, recent changes. Anyway, that's my ad lib to introduce you to add some thoughts to that, Leonard. Well, honestly, I'd say that they've got a pretty simple and straightforward uh, pathway right now, provided they want to keep things uh, uh, simple, low to the ground, um, line of sight. And, uh, uh, they just want to do some, you know, I, as you mentioned earlier, I'm part of the, uh, the original old generation that kind of helped lay some of the foundation. Uh, for what exists today now. So uh, when you talk about how hard it is or how hard it was, certainly it was hard uh, in the beginning. I've been, uh, you know, my first law uh, that I wrote was in 1993. And uh, when there was one guy at the FAA, and then uh, we evolved from there, and I've probably written 250, 300 codes since then. The reason I'm telling you that is that there is a. Uh, um, can, can you hear me right now? We got you loud and clear. Turn my sound off because this feedback. Yep. We should tell the audience that two old guys here tried to make Skype work earlier this afternoon, and it finally worked with the help of Young Zuri in the office here. Carry on, Leonard. You were good. Uh, were you getting any feedback? No, we're okay. Okay, I, I wanted to turn it off. 
Oh, Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. Yeah, what I was saying, you know, laying the foundation did take a lot of work. Like you said, it's us old guys that uh, were there uh, slinging the mud, walking through the tall grass uh, when there was no trail to cut. Uh, we were cutting the trail. Um, gladly, um, you know, that's what I've dedicated my life to. And it's guys like me and, and guys like us in the industry that, that uh, have uh, knocked down and felled a lot of the trees that now make up these regulations and rules that the uh, FAA has been able to hand out. And so I've really been glad, to do it, happy to do it. Uh, it's, it's been the love of my life. Uh, I used to think uh, when I was in the Army, I spent 24 years in the Army, I used to think that was uh, the love of my life until I got involved with unmanned aircraft. And that was back in 1993. And I found that uh, I had a whole new love of life uh, uh, once I got into that field. So uh, this is what I do. I'm very passionate. That's fantastic, Leonard. And the what you're observing is that the, the art that you generated and that you made possible has been converted now into practice, is what, uh, what we're seeing in the regulations of the FAR, uh, FAR 107 that has come out recently. So you can yep. see a lot of your efforts that are buried in, in the way the rules are interpreted and the way the rules are written. Absolutely. I see a great deal of the data that we collected uh, early on is now part of uh, everyday language, the regulations. So I'm, I'm really, really not only fascinated by the fact that, that uh, uh, I've uh, actually helped write some of the pages of history of this, but uh, uh, just uh, awesome that uh, I, I'm able to, to look at a legacy of my own. And uh, when I see a kid down flying a UAV, um, do I walk up to him and say, hey, I helped you get that thing airborne? No, I would never do that. But I look at my wife and we smirk at each other and smile and we say, we know we were there. You know, we helped lay the foundation for this, this road. And that's great. And it's also, in some ex to some extent, uh, helping the whole progression into STEM and the science, technology, engineering, and math aspects that are defining the future of, uh, in, our, in our cyber oriented and IT oriented world, in the sense that these UAS systems are much more. IT or cyber dependent than our aircraft that we're familiar with in the past, and that we have the ground station, you got the communications loop, and you got the unmanned air vehicle itself, all part of the system, and how that all interlates to the larger air traffic system is really a sort of a cyber issue. And the fact that we've been able to uh, get legislation and laws on the table that uh, that allow that kind of a complex, uh, a complex interactive system, dynamic system to operate uh, is, is really a testimony to the work that's been done by you and others in the past. Yeah, it sounds almost as if you're speaking about the unmanned traffic management <laughs> program that uh, NASA is creating, um, which uh, really resides inside the air traffic management system or ultimately will reside within and as part of the, uh, unman or the air traffic management system. And let's talk about that a little bit. Can you are you are you free to say anything about the status and progress being made in the uh, unmanned traffic management system? Only that NASA has been doing some fantastic work. We've got a lot of good partners. Uh, uh, we're uh, helping to save a lot of the technologies that are coming along, and uh, we expect to keep doing great work as we move along. Good. And uh, the air traffic management system, the UTM system program that NASA has generated is, is basically dealing with uh, safety by segregation, wouldn't you say? That is, it's defining a, an operating channel in the airspace that the UAV is allowed to use based on prior agreements and, and based on... Well, I'm not going to say that that is what its ultimate goal is going to be. And, and honestly, I don't think anybody really knows what UTM is going to look like in, in the end. And now you've got the treading in some dangerous waters here because you're asking me to speak on what NASA's policy precedents are, but the bottom line is air traffic management is what controls the airspace. UTM is a model that will be infused into ATM once it is finished. Okay, and then how, does, how, how do you think that UTM, when it is finished, in whatever configuration that ends up, how will the, F, the FAR, uh, Federal Aviation Regulation 107 rule set 
uh, play in with the unmanned traffic management system? Well, 107, I, I hope, is a living document. Um, as, as time goes on, as technology gets better, as people get smarter and more responsible, and, and we figure out the ins and outs of uh, not only what 107 brings us today, but what it has the potential to bring us later on, we'll, we'll evolve these regulations. And with that, the technology that supports the airspace is going to evolve as well. So I, I guess in interpreting that, uh, one of the aspects of uh, 107 is that in the various levels of regulated airspace, you require an air traffic management uh, clearance in order to operate the UAV in that airspace. And perhaps the unmanned traffic management program will fit with 107 in that way, in that the aspects of 107 that allow uh, operational channel to exist would be the means by which air traffic control provides that clearance uh, for you to operate. Well, perhaps it will be addressed by 107, but I don't know that for a fact now. You know, I think you're, you're right about 107 being a growing document. I mean, there's so many things that aren't defined for it yet, and they, I guess they'll be defined when uh, August 29th when it, uh, when it becomes formal. But there's going to be all the training associated with that. People have to get uh, unmanned air, aircraft licenses uh, through training and through testing. So there's a, there's a lot of evolution yet of... Uh, the specifics of the ins and outs of what's going to make 107 work. Yeah, the one thing that I will tell you is never put a calendar date on what the <laughs> FAA is going to give us. Um, I've learned that. I learned that 15 years ago, and I'm still learning that today. What I will tell you is that uh, hopefully 107 will remain a living document, take the lessons learned from each point in time and each, uh, whether it's a mistake or whether it's a success, and put it to uh, paper uh, into the 107. You know, and I've learned that uh, even even in this narrow, in this relatively recent time period of the last couple of years, when the 333 exemptions were out, that a lot of the experience that was gathered by the industry and by operators under the 333 exemptions have led to some of the policy aspects that are embedded in 107. So there is that that continual learning process and that continually. Uh, taking the right answers, the right approaches forward, and, and canceling the paths that aren't productive, that is part of that living document you're thinking of uh, that would characterize the future 107. Well, and there will be a lot of that, and some of it's going to have to be lessons learned that we learn out of mistakes. Uh, others are going to be uh, uh, lessons that we pick up automatically. One thing that I like to look at is. Uh, uh, I, I think about configuration control when I think about software and I think about cyber systems and IT systems. Configuration control is something that uh, says that uh, if I buy a computer that uh, can do X, Y, or Z, um, that's really all I can do. But with a UAV, one of the things that we've got to be uh, aware of is guys are buying these things and then they're going out and putting payloads on them that were never designed for things. They're putting weights on them were never designed. Uh, they're buying different types of batteries and adding to the configuration. So while the regulation stands out there and says, um, go ahead and register this UAV as a, let's call it a DJI Phantom 4, um, is that really what it is once you've configured that thing um, and you've put a gun on it, you've put a drop device on it, or you've changed the software, or you have upgrades to the software from the company. Is it still the same configuration that you registered when you registered that UAV for the first you time? Know, we, we, this show is now on two, two segments, not three, when, like when you were on last time. We'll take our first break here in a minute, but, I, but I, let's come back to that very issue, the issue of the ethics of configuration control, configuration management, and ultimately an ethics of design. That almost leads to TSOs and other kinds of standards, which is intriguing. Yes, it does. Yeah, let's, let's talk about that, Leonard, when we get back from our first break. <laughs> okay. Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard. I'm the host of Center Stage, which is on Wednesdays at 2 o'clock here on Think Tech. On Center Stage, I talk with artists about not only what they do and how they do it, but the meat of the conversation for me is why they do it, why we go through this. A lot of us are not making our livings doing this, and a lot of us would do this with our last dying breath if we had that choice. And that's what I love to talk to people about. I hope you enjoy watching it, and I hope you get inspired because there's an artist inside you too. Join us on Center Stage at 2 o'clock on Wednesdays. Bye. Aloha. 
I'm Richard Emery, host of Condo Insider, a weekly Thursday show at 3 o'clock that goes all summer long talking about issues living in a condo association. Each week we bring experts to talk about the rights and obligations of owners and boards of directors to successfully run their condominium. It's a great educational show, answers a lot of questions. We hope you'll visit us sometime. Aloha. Friday afternoon, folks, the Ides of July again, second half of our program, Where the Drone Leads on Think Tech OA. Ted Ralston in the studio downtown, and we're joined by Leonard Lagone, who is in New Mexico. And Leonard is a, a, a several, several times flyer on this show. Leonard, welcome back to our show, and thanks a lot for providing your insight to us on the, where the drone business is all going. Of course. Okay, great. We'll have you again, by the way. In fact, we ought to get you out here live. In fact, when the, <laughs> when the state of Hawaii UAS test site starts getting active and getting live, we probably need someone like you out here just to keep us straight and narrow for a while. We'll talk about that maybe on a future show. But what we were talking about just before the break is the, the sense that you've got, and I certainly have as well, that uh, we're running in, in a kind of an unregulated, we're running a, a form of regulation in an unregulated domain. That is the the definition of drones and what is a drone and what the what's what the drawing number that defines a drone. All that is a bit in jello right now in terms of uh, where we're going with the even federal well, aviation regulation have, 107. You have to consider a few things, Ted. Um, you know the FAA has got an awesome responsibility protecting the national airspace system and all of the certainly the manned aircraft that are using it and all the passengers sitting on those manned aircraft. And uh, their responsibility is phenomenally, almost impossible, some would say, but, but they do a great job. Now, what's going on is you've got the commercial industry that has stepped in and said, uh, we want to play with these things too, and we've got a job to do with these things. And I get that. I mean, I stand behind um, figuring out what the commercial avenues are to make these things uh, go to work for the John Q. Puppet. But uh, in order to do that, Congress had to step up and basically they had to slap the FAA a little bit and say, you guys aren't doing it fast enough, not enough for us. Our constituents are standing behind us telling us they want something and by golly, you're going to give it to us now. So consequently, the administrator, Huerta, obviously he had to almost sign his name in blood to make promises that he would put something out there. Now, what we've got is we've got a great start in 107, a good comprehensive document that gets us halfway where a lot of the commercial business industry want to be. Not all the way. Certainly, you know, they want to build beyond visual sight systems, and they want to go to the horizon, they want to surrogate satellites, and we still got a way to get there. But, uh, as I said, FAA had an awesome responsibility, and then when Congress stepped in and said, thou shalt, um, they had to put something in place. Some would call it a band-aid, some would call it putting a patch on it, uh, just to be able to tell Congress, there, see, we gave you some. But uh, honestly, I, I think it's a great step in the right direction, uh, but it's still got a long ways to go. And, you know, we, as we talked about earlier, configuration, uh, there's uh, VVNI software, then there's uh, uh, a lot of people don't even know what uh, things like an AP-1B are, or what the routes are that come out of an AP-1B, and how, where I'm going to operate with respect to those routes. Um, different classes of airspace, uh, what is clearly defined and not clearly defined with regard to liability. Um, you know, a person can operate a small UAV if they have uh, physical or mental conditions, but um, when the regulation comes out and says you certify yourself to be medically capable in order to get the license, what does that mean? Ability still. And that's that's exactly right. And that's what was going through my mind as, as we were talking before the break because uh, uh, the it looks like what's happened is the. Uh, the obligation that is typically present in aircraft certification, which is all the Part 25 certs or Part 33, whatever the certification may be for engines and airplanes and operators, that's been rolled over and been replaced by a obligation by the operator 
once he's got through this training and got himself a UAV operator's license, uh, to behave safely and to operate safely and to obey all the rules. So rather than force the operator or the, the, the configuration into a, a standards-based design set, again, it's simply been said, okay, you're responsible and implicitly your own liability management would define how much variation is allowed in that configuration or in your operation because you are responsible. So it's transferring the responsible responsibility from the standard writers and the rule writers over to the operator himself. And I, I suspect that we'll find over time and experience uh, that some form of standards will have to come back in, into the game, but it'll only Absolutely. be experience that tells us that. Certainly, yeah. I mean, we you take and tell a 16-year-old, I mean, I, I don't know about the 16-year-olds in your neighborhood, but in my neighborhood, if you give them a, a drone, uh, they're going to be dropping firecrackers from the thing, uh, among other things, chasing the neighbor's cats and, uh, and everything else. Uh, so uh, these are the guys that are buying these things. And, uh, you know, they're going to declare themselves uh, operable, uh, they're stable, uh, you know, uh, the liability is uh, going to rest at their shoulders. Let's uh, think about that. Right, and that, and that again turns into standards of some kind. In, fo in fact, the, uh, uh, the NTIA, I believe, and the, or the R R RTCA and uh, ASTM are both working on standards for structure and, and propulsion and integration and this sort of thing, as well as communication. Those, those professional societies are still pushing forward here on working through what they might come up with in terms of standards for those areas. And I suspect what will happen is the experience gained under the continued 333 work as well as the now 107 will point in the direction of whether some of those standards are needed. And then FAA will have available to it uh, a, a band of uh, professionals who have been working through this problem and are ready with standards that, that can come forward. But that will start constraining and, 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 and controlling the uh, configuration and the operations limitations and such in a way that are a little bit more, a lot more specific than what we have in the rules today, in, in the new rule today. Yeah. And so, uh, and, and actually the experience you're, you're gaining through NASA and the experience we're gaining through the FAA uh, test sites like Alaska's and Hawaii's and such uh, will contribute to all of that. So I think there's a, uh, as some people might think that 107 has, represents a, a major state change and an arrival of some new functionality in a walk in the park, but that isn't true. It's, as you said, it's just the beginning of that walk in the park. Now we have the, the beginning of the way to get experience growing and to get feedback from operations, and that'll all lead to this continual evolve cycle, evolution, evolution in thinking in the FAA of how you take what you've got and how you make it better and how you eliminate the, the traps that were not understood when the rules were written. Yeah, I guess you can kind of look at it the same way as we were at the beginning of the aviation industry. The first uh, pilot license uh, uh, came from the barnstormer that just told the guy, okay, you're good enough, go ahead, uh, you got it. And uh, you know, based on his uh, uh, word, um, I'm now qualified to fly. Um, today, we, as you say, we've developed the standards and the education process and and uh, the knowledge base that uh, we now uh, have a, a great system in place that takes a pretty long time to get. Um, you know, and certainly, if I want a pilot license, I'm going to spend four thousand uh, dollars just for my uh, just for my uh, you know small session requirements. And what we're going to see, in fact, on that account, just uh, so people watching this know, is that the, the test you have to take uh, in order to be, get your uh, 107 uh, unmanned air system certificate is going to cost 150 bucks. So we're now adding that level of, of uh, 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 you've got to be dedicated. You're going to go spend 150 bucks on a test. And if you, if you don't pass the test and you have to take it again, you get to spend 150 a second time. It isn't like once 150 and you keep going until you pass it. It's 150 every time you take it. So there's cost involved and there's implied liability involved that now is, is elevating the nature of the, of the business away from the RC airplanes and such, which don't have any of that or have, don't have much of that, into sort of in the, in the area where risk management people start paying attention to it. 
because there are liabilities and, attached. And for the small business, Ted, that's going to work out just fine. And even for the small business entrepreneur that's just starting out, that's going to work just fine. But for that 16-year-old kid that uh, uh, goes out there and buys that thing at Fry's Electronics or Radio Shack, um, you tell him he's going to need $150, he's going to look at you and say, yeah, sure, I'll, uh, I'll pull that right out and give it. And so we're going to see, uh, once again, the compliance issues are going to be a challenge and the, and the enforcement issues are going to be a challenge. And presently, there is nothing written into the law that addresses the enforcement thereof. Well, that's, that's the thing. We've, uh, we've had Craig Burns out here once. He's FAA's uh, West Coast, anyway, uh, law enforcement outreach guy. Alta takes care of laser. And uh, it's pretty clear uh, in his mind, as he explains it, that the, uh, the enforcement remains at the local law enforcement level. That means the police or sheriff's department, whatever it might be, county sheriff and such, that uh, are going to have to take care of the identification of a deviation from standard behavior and practice and then enforce it. They generate a report. The report may or may not go back to the FAA, who may take some action. But the FAA has no action they can take unless the guy has a license. So that situation you represent or you, you discussed of a 16-year-old kid who isn't going to spend 150 bucks on his license, that then turns into uh, one of these areas that's very difficult to police because he's not going to get a license, and if he doesn't have a license, the FAA has very little they can do to him because he's got nothing he can take away from him. So well, think about this. That there are 19,400 and I believe 40, 47, something like that, 19,400 plus uh, municipalities around the country uh, with uh, law enforcement uh, uh, you know, entities, agencies belonging to them. Now, there are many more law enforcement entities when you count state, federal, local, tribal, municipal, all of that. And somehow there has to be an education process that reaches out to these guys. Now, the International Association of Chiefs of Police, they have a pretty good uh, um, baseline where they can put out a gold standard and say, uh, um, we're offering a course, but it still takes those guys to come in and uh, be willing to pay for the time and the money to sp send their people to these courses. Yep. And okay. many of them are just too darn busy to worry about uh, a 16 year old kid who is doing something harmless uh, in their eyes, um, such as flying a drone. Uh, you know, around a park or something. You know, Leonard, let me, let, let's, let's uh, reserve this discussion for a follow-on program. That's a very important piece. We're working with the police department in Honolulu right now on that very issue. And exactly as you mentioned, understanding and education and training and what the prosecutor will accept are all the rules of the game. But at this point, we have reached the end of our new shortened program. <laughs> and Leonard, I thank you very much for coming on uh, late at night out there in New Mexico. And we'll see you again sometime on this show. And folks, we'll see you next Friday on Where the Drone Leads. <laughs>